who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by doing the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith into Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by doing works of the law because by doing works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Jump down to verse 20 if you would. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. The life I live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people you love so much. I pray, Father, we would encounter you this morning through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees with that, just say amen. Every book in the Bible has a verse or two that is the key to interpreting that entire book. It gives the thesis statement, if you will. It states the main point of the book. Right now, we're reading Paul's letter to the new believers in the region of Galatia, what is now modern-day Turkey. But this is no ordinary letter. It is a letter from heaven, a letter inspired by the Holy Spirit to speak across time and distance, to speak across the ages to you and to me. And chapter 2, verse 16, is the interpretive key to the whole book of Galatians. We know that a man is not justified by doing works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Paul talks here about living by faith. And the rest of Galatians describes what that is and what that looks like. Last week, we talked about what is faith. And if you were away for the long weekend, I really encourage you, go to our website, find the sermon, listen to it. You can go to our YouTube channel, uh, or you can get a CD from the Welcome Center, and I know that you'll be blessed. It's important to know what is faith, because the next few paragraphs of Paul's letter describe several spiritual realities and experiences which we access by faith. You see, faith is the doorway to God. Faith is the doorway to salvation. It's the means by which we lay hold of saving grace. Faith is the doorway to the kingdom of heaven. It's the doorway to the riches of God in Christ Jesus. Faith is the doorway to eternal life. When we have that moment of being convinced deep inside, When we have that moment of surrendering our will to Jesus, a whole new spiritual world opens up to us. That truth is captured by the words of one of the best loved hymns of all time, written by a young man who was once very angry, an alcoholic, a gambler, a carouser. He was dishonorably discharged from the Royal Navy, became a deckhand on a slave trading ship. And in the midst of a violent storm at sea, he found faith in the bow of a sinking ship and wrote the words, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And this is what he writes, How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Faith is a moment of access. Faith is a portal of access. The next several paragraphs of Galatians share several spiritual realities and experiences that lie on the other side of the doorway of faith. And the first one of those is union with Christ. Union with Christ is the most fundamental truth of the Christian faith that you've probably heard little or nothing about. So what is union with Christ? Looking at Paul's words, I see four truths, and I want to share them with you quickly this morning. Four truths. What is union with Christ? First of all, union with Christ means that your status has changed to in a relationship. Now, I want to tell you, for those of you who are on Facebook, nothing lights up Facebook like someone changing his status to in a relationship. When you put it up on Facebook, it ends weeks of speculation on the part of your friends and family. I knew something was going on there. When you put it on Facebook, it's serious. When you put it on Facebook, it's official. Do you know God has a book in heaven? 
not Facebook, the Lamb's book. And in it are written the names of all those whose statuses have been changed. You see, there is a moment of faith. There is a moment of being deeply convinced about Jesus. There's a moment of surrendering your will during which a bond, a relationship is initiated between you and Jesus. There's a moment of believing in which your status in heaven is changed from single sinner to in a relationship with Christ. When that happens, I want to tell you, all of heaven lights up. The angels light up. God doesn't tweet, but he does dispatch the dove of heaven to you. We're going to talk about that next week. The Holy Spirit is Pentecost Sunday next week. But it's called union with Christ. And it's the starting place of every other spiritual reality and experience in the Christian life. Union means that you are now vitally connected to Christ. Union with Christ is expressed in the New Testament by the words, in Christ. I in Christ and Christ in me. Paul used that expression, in Christ, more than anyone else, 216 times. John used in Christ 26 times. But Jesus himself was the first one to talk about union with Christ. He said, on that day, you will realize that you are in me and I am in you. In the upper room, Jesus used a picture to describe our union with him. He said, I am the vine, I am the stem, the trunk, and you are the branches. Abide in me. And I will abide in you, and you will be very fruitful. It still amazes me that God has programmed into creation the miracle that allows grafting. It amazes me that you can go over to a tree, and you can cut a branch off of that tree, and you can pick it up and carry it over to another tree, and you can make a slit in the bark of that tree, and you can stick those two cut places together, and the life of that trunk will flow into that cut branch, and the two will become one, and the trunk will keep that branch alive. Paul said that's exactly what happens to us when we believe on Jesus. He said, though you were a wild shoot, a wild branch, you have been grafted in now and you share the nourishing sap from the root. You see, at that moment of faith, you are a branch that gets cut away from your old source of life and you get grafted into Jesus. You become organically joined with him. You are permanently attached to him. You are distinct from him and he is distinct from you, but you are part of each other and his life flows into you and you become spiritually alive. God is the gardener. God is the one who makes that connection between you and Christ. Paul said, it is from God that you are in Christ. And that connection is vital, meaning that your spiritual life depends upon it. If the connection were to be severed, you would spiritually die. Union with Christ also means that you are now under the headship of Christ. Paul uses another picture to describe union with Christ. It's the connection between the head and the body. Christ is the head, and we are all members of his body. Just like the vine and branches, head and body shows us again that we are organically and vitally connected to Christ, but head and body adds another dimension. The body is not equal with the head. The head directs the body. Do you know that when you were being formed in your mother's womb, in the first four weeks, the first thing that developed on you was your brain and your central nervous system. You had a head before you had a heart. That means we are all lawyers by birth. <laughs> because poor Nick, hey, Pastor Nick's got to forgive me for that. <laughs> because... The head, the body relies upon the head for direction. In the same way, union with Christ is a relationship with him in which he is your head. He is your leader. 
Union with Christ also means that you now share a mystical bond of intimacy with Christ. Paul gives another picture that describes union with Christ. It is the one flesh bond that exists between a husband and wife in marriage. What a great time we had celebrating marriage this weekend here at Harvest Time. John and Edna Lahara, I can't say thank you enough to you for bringing the Art of Marriage Conference to us and for everyone who helped out Friday evening and Saturday morning. It was a tremendous time. But the magic of marriage is the beautiful one flesh bond that God creates between a husband and a wife. Beloved, don't believe it when people say that Jesus never addressed the issue of homosexual marriage. Jesus did address it by affirming unequivocally what marriage is. In Matthew 19.4, Jesus said, Haven't you read that in the beginning God created them male and female? In Genesis, it says God looked around at his creation, and what it literally says in Hebrew is that God noticed that every other creature had, had a mate with corresponding body parts except Adam. So God made Eve. God made women for men, and God made men for women. God made male parts to correspond with female parts, and he made female parts to correspond with male parts, and all God's people said... Amen. Jesus continued for this reason. A man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one. When a husband and wife, within the sacred covenant of marriage, physically join their bodies together, God causes a supernatural bond to form between them. It's a powerful connection. It's a powerful intellectual connection. It's a powerful emotional connection. It's a powerful spiritual connection. In fact, it is the most intimate bond that can possibly exist between two people on earth. And that sense of connectedness stays with you long after intercourse. You're still one flesh when you're working. You're still one flesh when you're working out. You're still one flesh when you're traveling on business. You're still one flesh when you're shopping, when you're paying bills, when you're playing with the kids. The result of sex within marriage is an abiding sense of well-being. You feel secure and significant. You feel understood and affirmed. You feel lovable and lovely and loved. You feel confident. You feel fulfilled. Now listen to me. God only does this supernatural joining together between one man and one woman within the sacred covenant of marriage. God will not supernaturally glue together a hookup. God will not supernaturally glue together a dating couple. He will not supernaturally glue together a cohabitating couple. Doesn't matter how much you love each other. If you love each other, wait. Doesn't matter how deeply committed you are to each other. If you're that committed, get married. Because God's requirement is the covenant of marriage. Now look, and you're looking real mean right now. Don't shoot the messenger. I'm just telling you, it's in the book. I'm just, it's in the book. I'm just saying what's here in the book. It's in the book. Neither will God supernaturally glue together a man and a man or a woman and a woman. People might join their bodies together. But outside of marriage, God will not grant them that blessing of the one flesh bond that is fulfilling and security building and soul satisfying. Now, Paul says that the one flesh bond between a husband and wife is a picture of the bond that God creates between believers and Jesus Christ. In fact, the earthly picture is just a shadow of the true heavenly glory. Whoever is united to the Lord is one spirit with him. Paul calls that a profound mystery. God gives us an abiding sense of connectedness to Christ. We feel spiritually connected to him. We feel emotionally connected to him. We feel intellectually connected with him. We sense that Christ is with us and that he is interested in us. 
Listen, Jesus is a good lover. He doesn't have his face buried in his iPhone. He's not on Facebook. He's not watching hockey or baseball or Bill O'Reilly, but he does love Bill O'Reilly. <laughs> in that mystical bond with Christ is ultimate fulfillment, of which even the best of marriages is just a mere shadow. You feel ultimately secure, ultimately significant, ultimately understood, ultimately affirmed and loved, ultimately confident and fulfilled. What is union with Christ? It means that you are now in a relationship. What is union with Christ? Four truths. Union with Christ, number two, means that you are now presumed innocent by association. Union with Christ is the basis of the spiritual truths we call atonement, imputation, justification, and identification with Christ. Don't worry, I'll explain it to you. But taken all together, what those truths mean is that because of union with Christ, you are now innocent by association. Anybody ever been presumed guilty by association? I remember one time when I was a kid, I was in a 7-Eleven, and a clerk accused me of shoplifting candy. I didn't know it. I hadn't taken anything, but I was with some boys in my neighborhood who had taken some things before, and so he made me empty out my pockets. You ever see a 10-year-old empty out his pockets? There were matchbox cars and marbles and baseball cards and rocks and everything you can imagine. The other customers were laughing. I put this mountain of stuff. There was nothing stolen, but I was presumed guilty by association. Actually, the Bible says that God presumes all of us guilty by association. We are all born into a state that Paul calls in Adam. You see, from birth, Adam's sin is charged to our account. From the very start, God considers us liable for Adam's sin. Maybe you've heard of some predatory lenders who offer credit cards to people that have bad credit. They charge excessive membership fees. They charge exorbitant interest rates. So by the time the first statement arrives, the account holders are shocked to find out that they already owe hundreds of dollars and they haven't purchased a single thing. And in no time, their debt snowballs out of control. That is precisely what it's like to be born in Adam. We are all born in debt. We are all born in the red. We're already in the hole. We already have a balance due to God. You know, that might sound unfair. But when Adam sinned, he wasn't acting only personally. He was acting representatively as the head of the human race. And when you add to that our own sins, because we have all sinned, in no time our debt snowballs out of control. There is no possibility of ever redeeming ourselves. There's no way we could ever repay that sin debt to God. So God did the only thing that could be done and what only God could do. Jesus came to earth to be presumed guilty by association. God himself put on a body of human flesh and he came to this earth. And as the unique God-man, Jesus became the head of a whole new race. You see, as the son of God, he wasn't born in Adam. He wasn't born in debt. He wasn't born under the presumption of guilt. But as the son of man, he identified with humanity in every way. He became like us in every regard. He was tempted in every way, just as we are yet without sin. Jesus lived a life of perfect obedience to God. In fact, Paul says his ultimate act of obedience was to offer his life as a sacrifice for the sins of the world on the cross. On the cross, Jesus bore our sins in his body. God made him to become sin for us. Now listen, that doesn't mean that Jesus became a sinner. But God presumed Jesus guilty by association. God charged our sins to Jesus' account. Jesus didn't commit the sins, but he paid the penalty. A while back ago, Denise and I took the kids out to eat one night. We went to pizza and brew. 
And there were our friends, Les and Mary Pavanetti, eating with their kids. We sat down at a table, we ordered, we ate, and when it was time to go, we asked for the bill. Only to discover that Les and Mary had already paid the bill and had slipped away. Les and Mary didn't order the food on our table. They didn't enjoy the food on our table. They weren't responsible for the tab that we ran up, but they paid it for us. And that's just like God. On the cross, God redirected our tab to Jesus. And Jesus paid it all. Now listen. When by faith you become united to Christ, God presumes you innocent by association. In that moment of faith, in that moment of believing and surrender, what Jesus did on the cross becomes applied to you personally. And so you are no longer in Adam. Now you are in Christ. And because you are no longer in Adam, you are no longer presumed guilty by association. But instead, because you are in Christ, you are now presumed innocent by association. When Jesus lived perfectly obedient to God, he wasn't only acting personally, but he was acting as the head of a new race. He was obedient representatively. So even though you didn't obey, in Christ, God credits Jesus' obedience to you and he rewards you as if you had obeyed. No wonder Hebrews calls this so great a salvation. What other God worshipped by any other name anywhere in the world has ever done what Jesus has done for us? These are the great spiritual truths called atonement, imputation, justification. Adam sinned and his guilt was imputed. It was charged to all of humanity. Christ was perfectly obedient and all of humanity's guilt was imputed, charged to him. Some believe, some receive the gift of faith and Christ's perfect obedience is imputed, credited to them. Atonement means an exchange. When you believe your guilt punishment is diverted to Christ and Christ's righteous reward is diverted to you. Justification means that God now regards you as in possession of a righteousness that is not your own. Even though you didn't obey, God regards you as you have. Even though you didn't obey, God rewards you as if you have. In Christ you are now innocent by association. I don't know about you, but I'm going to start speaking in tongues any minute. That's good right there. What is union with Christ? Four truths. Number three. Oh, I got to hurry. I'm in trouble. It's not my fault. You took too long to take communion. So, <laughs> Number three. Union with Christ means that you are now the beneficiary of identity gift. Take a little poll here. How many of you have ever been the victim of identity theft? Let me see your hand. Have you been the victim of identity theft? Denise and I have a couple of times. Someone got a hold of my debit card information once, got it, I think from a card reader, and went on a spending spree and charged like $1,400 in Brooklyn. Someone opened a credit card in Denise's name and bought a couple thousand dollars of Apple stuff. Actually, the entire human race is the victim of identity theft. Our innocence, our authority, our dignity, our fellowship with God was robbed from us. But when we are in Christ, we become the beneficiaries of identity gift. In Christ, you are no longer Satan's victim, but in Christ, you are now God's beneficiary. Rather than having our identity stolen, we are given the credit that belongs to a better identity. Imagine if Warren Buffett walked up to you and said, Hey, here's my Amex. Go be me for the weekend. What would you do? I wonder if you can charge phase two on an Amex. I think Warren's Amex could handle it. Imagine if Billy Joel said, hey, here's my Ferrari and the keys to the house in the Hamptons. Go be me for a weekend. Mi casa, su casa. 
That's exactly what it's like to be in Christ. We have been given free access to everything that belongs to him. His casa is mi casa. In some way that's beyond our understanding, when we're in Christ... What he experienced becomes my experience. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Christ died. So somehow, in a way I can't even explain to you, in Christ I die too. Christ arose. So somehow, in Christ, in a way that I can't even explain, I have risen too. Christ has ascended. So in Christ I have ascended. Christ has dominion, so in Christ I have dominion too. Here's a thought that'll blow your mind. At the end of the age, Jesus said, All the dead of all time, all humanity, all the dead will be raised to face the final judgment. But not those of us who are in Christ. Because the moment we believed, we already passed through the judgment. We already made it through. God has already made his decision about you. God has already issued his verdict about you. Presumed innocent by association. And listen to this. Because we have already passed through the final judgment, we already have access to the rewards that lie on the other side of the final judgment. Because we have already passed through the judgment, we already have access to eternal life. Because we have already passed through the judgment, we already have access to heaven on earth. Because we have already passed through the judgment, we already have access to all the riches of God in Jesus Christ. If you think about that, that'll bless you. That's why Jesus preached, repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Believe, surrender, pass ahead through the final judgment, and access will be given to you now to heaven on earth. In Christ, we are the beneficiaries of identity gift. What is union with Christ? It means you're in a relationship. It means you're innocent by association. It means you're the beneficiary of identity gift. And one final thing I want to share with you. Worship team, come and help me. Union with Christ. This is a good one. Union with Christ remains true even when you don't feel like it. Union with Christ helps us to understand something awesome about our closeness to God. You know, sometimes we can have very strong feelings that cause us to forget the facts of our new life in Christ. In August, Denise and I will be married 19 years. And we couldn't be any more married than we are. I know that sounds like a sweet sentiment, but actually I don't mean it sentimentally. I mean it factually. Legally and covenantally before God, there is nothing more we could do to be any more married than we are. We couldn't be any more married if we went to town hall and we got another marriage license. We couldn't be any more married if we came to the altar of a church and we went through a wedding ceremony legally and covenantally before God. We're already as married as we can possibly be. We got married on August 19th, 1995, and we can't get any more married. Now, intimacy in marriage is another matter altogether. Intimacy depends on time spent together. There is no quality time without quantity time. You know, it's kind of a divine irony. Intimacy brings to your marriage the gift of children, and then children rob your marriage of the gift of intimacy. <laughs> 
know what's going on in my house last night. All night there were people wandering around my house. My son sleeps walk. There were, there were folks I couldn't, you know, you, I just need a nice sleep. Intimacy depends on the quality of communication. It depends upon care and attention. It depends upon fidelity. But listen, here's the truth. Grab onto this with your spirit. Even when intimacy is running low in your marriage and you don't feel as connected to your spouse as perhaps you once did, you are still as married as you could possibly be. Your disconnected feelings don't make you any less married, either legally or covenantally, before God. In fact, even if two married spouses have lived apart from one another for years, if one tries to remarry someone else, he will very quickly discover that he is still married. And that helps us to understand an awesome truth. In Christ, you are already as closely connected to God as you can ever be. How many times do we feel and we pray, God, I want to be closer to you. I, I want to be near. I feel far away. God, I want to be closer to you. But actually, in Christ, you are already as close to God as you could ever be. Legally and covenantally, it is not possible for you to get any closer. How close are you to God? As close as Jesus is to God because you are in Christ. Now, intimacy with God is another matter altogether. Intimacy depends on your investment of time. It depends upon the quality of your communication. It depends on your care and attention and your fidelity. There are all kinds of things that can rob us of intimacy with God. Jesus said the cares of this life, the responsibilities, the pleasures, the pursuits, the struggles, the sorrows, I was with someone this week who's grieving just a horrible loss, said to me, I just don't feel God. I can't hear his voice right now. It's because the sorrow that they're grieving is just blocking his voice for a little bit. Apathy robs us of intimacy. Neglect robs us of intimacy. Disobedience to God, the tricks of the enemy. But here's the word of the Lord for someone in the house today. If you have trusted in Jesus as your Savior, you are in Christ and you are already as closely connected to God as you could ever be. If you don't feel very close to Him at the moment, it's not that you need to get closer to God. You can't get closer to God. You just need to get intimate with Him. So receive an encouraging word today. If you're feeling disconnected, if you're feeling distant, if you're feeling out of touch, if you're feeling like there's no communication, union with Christ is a fact that is stronger than your present feelings. You're already connected as much as you could ever be. What you need is just a little more intimacy. You and Jesus need a weekend away together to reconnect. You need a date night once a week with Jesus. You need to rearrange your priorities. You need to change your daily schedule up a little bit. You, you need some quality daily conversation in the word and in prayer. You just need to serenade him again with some love songs. Jesus said, if you've lost your first love, begin to do the things that you did at the beginning. But if you're here and you're struggling with this right now, the Holy Spirit wants to encourage you. Don't let your faith be driven by your feelings, which go up and down. Instead, let your faith be driven by the facts of his word. You are united with Christ. You are in Christ and Christ is in you. You are a new creation in Christ. You are God's handiwork in Christ. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. You are God's son, God's daughter in Christ. Your life is hidden in God with Christ. 
You have been joined by God to Christ. You are vitally connected to Christ. You are alive by faith in Christ. You are thriving under the headship of Christ. You share a mystical bond of intimacy with Christ. You are innocent by association in Christ. You are free in condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. You are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified in Christ. You are dead to sin in Christ. You've been buried in Christ. You have been baptized into Christ. You have been raised to newness of life in Christ. You are clothed with Christ. You are fruitful in Christ. You are the beneficiary of identity gift in Christ. You are already seated on a throne in heaven in Christ. You are joint heirs with Christ. You are free in Christ. You have eternal life by faith in Christ. It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You are in Christ. Come on, give the Lord a praise in this place. Hallelujah. Last week I gave you some mustard seeds. Y'all did weird things with the mustard seeds. Some people planted the mustard seeds. Some people gave them away. Some people have them on their workstation. I gave you some mustard seeds to remind you that faith is powerful, even just a little bit. Today it's a wedding band. Did you get your wedding band on the way in? You got your wedding band? Now listen, don't wear this too long on your finger. It'll turn green. But maybe this will help to remind you that no matter what you're facing right now, no matter what you're feeling right now, the facts of God's word are stronger than your feelings. And the fact is, you are united with Christ. What I want to do to end is, I want to just give you one minute for intimacy with him. We're going to just worship. I've asked Pastor Jason to just lead us in a worship song. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to just forget about everyone else. I want you to forget about everything else for just one moment. And I want you to just focus in on Christ. Fact is, you're married. Fact is, you're bound in a relationship with him. Would you take one minute this morning and love on him before we go? Come on, Jason, help us out. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the love. Come on, give the Lord a great big praise. pray for you in just one moment but before I do I have to ask this question I wonder if there's someone here and somewhere recently you know that you arrived at the place of believing you know that you don't understand it all but just somewhere deep down inside you know it's right you know it's true you know Jesus is the son of God you know he's the savior so somewhere recently, you, you reached that point of believing, but you never had that moment of surrender. Faith is a moment of believing and a moment of surrender. And when we pass through that doorway of believing and surrender, a whole new world opens up to us. Faith is the doorway through which we access everything God has for us. I can't help feeling like maybe there's someone here in this service. You know you've reached the point of believing, but you've never had that moment of surrender. 
where you simply say to Jesus, yes, I submit to your leadership. I'm giving you my life. I'm going to follow you, Jesus. I'm coming under you. And I wonder if there's someone here and you'd like to make that moment of surrender right now. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way. I'm simply going to pray with you. If you're here and you know you've believed and now it's time to surrender, while heads are bowed all over this place, I want you to just lift up your hand real high wherever you are. And I want to pray with you. There's one, there's two, come on. Is there someone else? There's three, there's four, there's five. Come on, is there someone else I want to surrender? There's six, come on, is there someone else? It's my time to surrender. Oh, come on. Uh, there's seven. There's another one. Come on. Is there someone else? It's time to surrender. Come on. There's, there's another little hand. Come on, someone else. I want to surrender. I want to surrender. Come on. Is there someone else? There's someone else right there. I want to surrender. Yeah, come on. It's a great day. Heaven, heaven, is, light, heaven is lit up right now. The angels are lit up right now. A status was just changed in Lamb's book and your name was written right there in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah! Come on, everybody, all over this place, would you lift up your hands with me? I'm going to lead you in a prayer and I want everyone to help us pray. I surrendered. I believed and surrendered when I was eight years old and the presence of Jesus came to me and he's never left. Maybe you've already prayed this prayer like me, but I want you to help us pray it again. Lift up your hands real high. I'm going to lead us, and I want you to pray with me in a nice, loud voice. And let's help some people pass through the doorway of faith this morning. Come on, let's pray right now. I'll lead you follow. Father, thank you for loving me. Father, thank you for sending your only son. Jesus, thank you for coming. You lived a life of perfect obedience on my behalf. You died on the cross for me. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you rose from the dead. I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Jesus, I believe. Now I surrender. I want to be your follower. I want to be your servant. I want to be in you and you in me. Jesus, make me a new creation. Make me a child of God. Wash me. Make me clean. Jesus, give me the Holy Spirit. I confess you now as my Lord and the leader of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. How many of you know it's a great Sunday? God is with us. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, I want you to come real quick to the altar as soon as we dismiss. And we want to pray and celebrate with you. You have a wedding ring. It's to remind you that you are in Christ. For our benediction, I want you to bless three or four or five people. And I want you to just say, I'm in Christ. God bless you, everyone. Have a great Sunday. God be with you. We'll see you this week. You are clothed with Christ. You are fruitful in Christ. You are the beneficiary of identity gift in Christ. You are already seated on a throne in heavenly places with Christ. You are joint heirs with Christ.